Well, my name is Jimmy Whitaker, uh, and I'll be talking to you today about MLOps 0 to 60, how to version control, unify, and manage code life cycles. So, um, so yeah, we're just going to go ahead and jump right in, and uh, and yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, we'll definitely do some questions at the end, so if you have anything, pop it in the chat. I probably won't really be looking at it like during the, the course of the talk, but um, we'll definitely loop around to the end, and I'll scroll through, and we'll, we'll talk about some things. So. Um, so yeah, before we get started, I want to give you a brief overview of who I am, uh, just so you have some context. And we'll be talking uh, talking about a lot of things that uh, <laughs> overlap with with my background as we go through here. So my name is Jimmy Whitaker. Um, I am chief scientist of AI at Pachyderm, uh, and at Pachyderm, we're working on some of the harder data logistics problems that exist in machine learning. So. I myself, I joined Pachyderm after leading and working with applied research teams to build NLP and speech recognition models for financial institutions. And while we were actually working on these models and building these things, we had pretty consistently run into issues that centered on data management and iterative model improvements, and even the scalability of the tools and processes that we were trying to put in place. So many of the things that we're going to talk about today um, actually center around things that I've dealt with firsthand and things that I've experienced. So if you have questions about some of this stuff, definitely uh, drop that in the chat. So, um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's get started. So our agenda for today, <clears throat> we're first going to start with an introduction to machine learning operations. And what we're going to do here is we're going to start with talking about uh, software development and how, um, how kind of DevOps came about. And then we're going to see what we can learn from DevOps and how that applies to machine learning operations. Then we're going to talk about uh, kind of an introduction to Pachyderm, which is where I am and what the what the the things that we're working on, how we're trying to solve some of these logistics, uh, data logistics problems and um, the data lifecycle. And then we're going to talk about machine learning ops and practice. So we're going to go through a market sentiment example and how we incorporate the data lifecycle into a real world scenario. And then we're actually going to do a demo. We're going to walk through a lot of these things and you can see how how they work. And then we'll have some time for some Q&A at the end. Uh, so with that, uh, let's let's jump right in. All right. So first, we're going to start with AI versus the hype versus the reality. So I think we're all pretty familiar with uh, some of these different um, I don't know, news articles that come out, and we're used to the buildup of AI and the potential of it all, and how it can change the world and all these other things. But for me, at least, when it comes to seeing this in practice, it looks something more similar to this. Um, the biggest difference here is that AI machine learning does have the capability to solve many of these problems, but the ability for it to do so depends largely on applying machine learning techniques and applying them in the right way. And we're constantly seeing this hype that's generated by research models and the amazing capabilities, but these are often uh, on very curated data sets and misrepresent the ability to actually do it in practice. And doing it consistently on real-world data is very much the, the topic of MLOps and uh, what I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with uh, coming into this conversation and uh, into this, this, uh, this conference to, to learn about and to, to talk about. So <clears throat> let's first take a step back and let's talk about what best practices for software development look like. And then we'll start looking at how it applied to uh, how we can take these things and apply them to machine learning. So we, let's first talk about traditional programming. So traditional programming is how we tell a computer to accomplish a task. Um, it's a explicitly programmed logic for anything that we want to do, which usually takes an input, does some type of transformation to it, and provides an output. And we can give the computer a sequence of instructions to accomplish this task. And these, these instructions follow a logical structure, so conditions, loops, mathematics, et cetera. And this, uh, this approach, this traditional programming approach, tells a computer to do uh, do something and it's dependable. It runs the exact same way every single time. Um, but the difficulty there is we are telling it exactly what to do. So the program itself, the computer, isn't making a mistake uh, at all. It's always going to do exactly what we tell it to do. But the difficulty is, um, oh, sorry, I just see a, a PSA that my slides may not be updating. Is that true? Okay, perfect. All right, <laughs> sounds good. Sorry, just want to make sure everybody's having a good experience. All right, so, um, so perfect. So, uh, so basically, what we're what we're realizing is computers don't really make mistakes. The humans that are programming the computers are the ones that are potentially making mistakes. And this isn't necessarily intentional or oversight. It's that when we first start programming something, 
um, <clears throat> we often don't have the full picture or we're trying to push something out knowing that there's probably going to be some errors and some some gaps in what we see in production but uh, we are okay with those because at least in most of the scenarios we're taking care of the situation and so really what uh, many of the processes that we put in place logistically are really uh, put into place to help humans not make mistakes or fix them quickly so that we can understand the problem better. And uh, how we actually pr put that into uh, processes and operations is how we actually move, impart our human understanding of a problem to a computer while simultaneously uh, ensuring that the computer doesn't make human mistakes that are, that are always inevitable. And so this really is how DevOps came around. So DevOps itself centers around the idea that setting yourself up for reliable, high-velocity iteration is actually going to lead to the best software. And accomplishing this relies on a set of philosophies and practices and, uh, and tools to uh, improve an organization's ability to iterate on your software in a consistent and logical manner. And in order to iterate through this lifecycle reliably, we need tooling and practices to help us manage our code along the, along the way. So DevOps itself is really the goal of we're trying to incorporate development and operations into the same realm so that we can not only create our software, but that we can package it up, release it, monitor it in production, figure out what things are going wrong or what improvements we can make, and then continue this loop in uh, as fast of an iteration, as fast and reliable of an iteration as possible. So that's really the, uh, the main goal of DevOps itself. Now, the way we accomplish that and the things that we can uh, learn from DevOps is that there are a few key developments that were needed for the shift from uh, the typical way we did software development, which is kind of a, a waterfall, a lot of planning, <clears throat> to something that um, could be more iterative. And this, this adapt, uh, adoption rather, of DevOps has led to shorter development life cycles and improved dependability and even deployment speed and all these other things. And the key developments to do this uh, really center around two things, and I have five things listed here, and that is managing versions of your code, so version control, and then automating uh, different parts of uh, the deployment and release and monitoring process to actually make sure that you can incorporate um, your understanding of what's going on so that you can iterate on your code. And so version control itself is how we manage the different versions of our code. We're all, I assume, very familiar with Git and how we can iterate on our code and track the history of things, even the ability to roll back if we need to. On the CICD front, this is really how we're automating testing uh, of our code. So um, if we can put in tests in place or to put tests in place to make sure that we're checking our code and making sure we're not um, causing errors or introducing errors for things that we know are tested and functional, then we can actually make sure that um, we are testing these things so humans don't have to go through and QA every little piece of the software so that we know we can release a little bit more reliably and remove some of the manual overhead so humans don't have to have this huge cognitive load and think about all the different things that can potentially go wrong with the software. The next thing is agile software development, and this is really enabled by version control and CI/CD. And this is that uh, with these two things, version control and CI/CD, we can uh, incorporate shorter release cycles, incorporate feedback, and even emphasize team collaboration for how we're iterating on our software and incorporating tests. And um, we can do all these things and move forward, always knowing we can go back in time uh, if we need to undo something. And then uh, the last two here, continuous monitoring infrastructure as code. These are just providing visibility and dependability into our deployment of our software. And so all these things together, uh, or for anyone that doesn't know, uh, these, these things together, DevOps was and is a huge win in the software development world. And these practices uh, work amazingly well for code. And uh, there are specific tools that have allowed this. I mean, everyone's probably familiar with Git, obviously, or um, Jenkins, or Clear. Uh, Circle CI, so not clear. Uh, Circle CI and some of these other things in the CI/CD area, but <clears throat> all of these things work amazingly well for code. But what about for machine learning and for uh, and for data development in particular? So now let's start uh, taking. So we've talked a little bit about uh, traditional programming, but now let's talk about machine learning and what it is and how it's different from traditional programming. So. First, let's start with what is machine learning? And this is a pretty basic uh, conversation, but uh, for, for this audience in particular, but if we start with the basics, machine learning is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So when we look at a comparison of traditional programming and machine learning, the benefit of traditional programming is that it will always run the same uh, in every scenario, but the downside is we have to account for every possible situation. 
And in the, case, in the machine learning case, we're actually swapping the need to account for every possible situation for data. So instead, uh, so we're actually, uh, instead of having to, uh, um, in this case for uh, an, op uh, sorry, an image classifier for an animal, in, in our case, a cat or a dog, instead of having to describe every combination of pixels that can look like a cat or a dog, and possibly even going down the route of describing shapes and objects and all the different angles that you can see those shapes and objects, instead of having to do that in uh, a very verbose and laborious way, what we can do is we can detect the difference between cats and dogs by uh, providing a machine learning algorithm with many different labeled photos of cats and dogs and have the model learn how to do this. And this re seems relatively straightforward, especially for the audience we have here. Um, but as soon as we do this, we're actually uh, swapping out our traditional deterministic programming logic with machine learning. And obviously I'm kind of overlooking any type of random uh, processes or something you may have in traditional programming, but um, we're swapping out with data. So now we don't just have our code, we have our code and our data that are coming together to produce a model. And as soon as we take this uh, and start looking at our data and start working with uh, this type of approach in the machine learning approach, we see that this data is becoming um, just as critical as the code and real world data itself makes it much more complicated. So for instance, if we take that cat dog classifier and go one step further, if we were to apply it to an image like this, what will we expect to happen? There's both a cat and a dog in this image. And in general, we would expect our classifier, it can only do one of two things, uh, or it can only classify one of two things. And so therefore we would probably see a distribution uh, that was either even or slightly biased in one direction or another, just depending on how it was trained or what it was trained on. But when we get to a scenario like this, we already now see the need to move from <clears throat> something simple like image classification to object detection. But even more so, uh, if we're labeling data for object detection, which one of these would we consider to be correct? So this really simple task uh, and, and incorrect prompt, if we if we really <laughs> think about it a little bit, um, <clears throat> of draw draw bound excuse me draw bounding boxes around the animals, um, it can lead to a, a variety of different understandings. Um, and this is a simple example, but uh, something that we see pretty common in uh, in healthcare, uh, computer vision, and other types of things like that, where uh, the definition or the prompt itself can be a little bit ambiguous. So for instance, the first ex uh, image example, there is a bounding box around all the animals. The second one, there is a full bounding box around all of the dog and all of the cat, but they're nested. And so you can have some issues there depending on how you're uh, training your algorithm. And then the last picture, we have a full image or full bounding box around the cat, but only a partial uh, or a bounding box around the, the head of the dog in that one. So um, we're not really representing the real world in that we have a full box uh, around the, the dog itself, but we don't have the issue of nested bounding boxes. And so this sim uh, seemingly simple task, uh, even experts would tend to disagree on which one is correct, and it very much depends on the, the problem itself. And so uh, while we talk about machine learning systems uh, in general, actually curating data um, for them can actually be a very, very difficult process. And our machine learning systems rely on good data to actually be able to, uh, to produce the, the desired output that we want. So if our data is wrong, our model is going to learn the wrong insights about the world. And uh, not only that, it takes time for us to apply our human expertise and understanding of the world to individual data points. For instance, if we had only ever seen a single picture of a cat or a single picture of our dog from our consumers, then we may never have thought to uh, like what it would do in the case of an image of two things together. Um, and, but as our as our um, as our understanding of the problem improves and changes over time, this is where applying our human understanding of the problem to our data uh, becomes crucial and pretty difficult. And I typically refer to these things as uh, these issues with uh, with data itself as data bugs. So similar to our coding bugs. In machine learning, uh, data is really almost just as part of our source code as anything else. And we see data bugs every day in the news, some with huge reputational damage or even significant safety concerns in the case of uh, autopilot type things or these adversarial and perturbation attacks. Um, and even I myself, like when I worked on speech recognition uh, concepts or speech, re speech recognition models on various concepts in the financial world, um, I remember having to decide really heavily on how to combine uh, our data or what's, what's the right view of the world that we want to represent. 
So for example, we were trying to decide whether uh, to incorporate ums or us into our transcripts because they do convey the real world for instance, if I'm speaking right now, and uh, it does convey what I'm actually saying if I'm saying um or uh in between sentences. However, uh, they hinder the ability to read the transcript itself. So there can be downstream implications in NLP models or other types of things. And this idea of centering or moving more towards a data focus in the machine learning development process this idea is becoming a lot more popular. So with the likes of Andrew Ng and others realizing that the power of their models comes from their data and not necessarily from uh, the model and technique itself, uh, that most techniques are generally well, do well enough today, um, this is becoming a much more common thing, this idea of data-centric development and those kinds of things. And so this is, tends to be how I personally think about uh, machine learning, that we no longer have just one development life cycle that is our code. We have two development life cycles that have kind of a symbiotic relationship between the two. So for instance, uh, in this case, we have our code development life cycle, which we know is, is pretty commonly managed with DevOps types approaches. But then our data life cycle is something that is kind of overlooked a lot of the time. So, uh, so rather than just a single simple development lifecycle, we have these two things happening at the same time. Then when we incorporate model training or even monitoring, uh, there's this overlap of these two data life cycles. So for instance, our model training is going to produce artifacts that need to be managed and tested and everything themselves. Um, and also when we're monitoring things in production, we're usually applying code to our production data and we need to test whether that data uh, or whether those predictions are accurate for what we want to represent. And so in a nutshell, this is machine learning operations, You're managing all the different moving pieces of machine learning and then operationalizing it, or the two different pieces of the life cycles. And if we look at what those pieces are, uh, it usually look, or in my opinion, it looks something like this. <clears throat> so for example, uh, and this looks pretty verbose, and I apologize if this is a little bit small, uh, we'll definitely share uh, presentation and things with, with people later on. Um, but we have kind of these machine learning operations principles that are the same as kind of the DevOps principles that we talked about earlier, only this is across the different life cycles. So um, here I call them the loops, but the code loop, the data loop, and the model training, uh, we have versioning is just as important. You wanna have a path or understand and even version the different versions of your data set or where the data came from, how it was pre-processed and transformed and all these things. You need to do testing across both your code, your data, as well as your models. Uh, the more that you can incorporate automation, the less errors, the fewer errors you're going to get from uh, human or from human uh, <laughs> manual um, processes there. Um, and then reproducibility. This is really crucial for not only models that we produce themselves, but even how we got to the version of the data that we're using, or how do we track uh, how data was labeled over time? And can we go back to a previous version if somebody uh, labeled a lot of things the wrong way with the wrong understanding? And then additionally for deployment and monitoring, uh, these are some components that people tend to focus on quite a bit for machine learning operations, um, and they're, they're crucial for the deployment and monitoring. But all of these pieces together are kind of the full view and all the different moving pieces of, uh, of machine learning operations. And if we go one step further and think about, um, this is actually uh, a picture that was adapted from the ML test score paper, which is an incredible paper out of Google that came out to think about how you're monitoring and testing not only your software, but also your machine learning applications. In the traditional uh, programming sense and with software engineering, we had our code and our running system with unit tests, integration tests, and system monitoring to, uh, for those, those were the different pieces that we really needed to focus on. But when we move to machine learning based systems, we see something that's much more complex. We still have our code and our running system, but we also have this model training stage in the middle. And not only do we, have, do we have unit tests that are for our code, we also have these different types of data tests and data monitoring that we need to do, as well as these integration tests for the different running systems. So our, our code, our model training system, as well as our running production applications as well. And monitoring and, uh, mo uh, sorry, monitoring and testing for our data also cuts across all these different things. So right now I've kind of described a lot of moving pieces and the different things to think about abstractly when it comes to machine learning. And so how do we actually take a practical uh, um, attempt at solving some of these things? And so now we're gonna actually shift to something that we've been working on at Pachyderm, uh, which is how we actually approach machine learning and in particular this data loop. Because in the code world, uh, DevOps practices need to uh, 
need to actually be incorporated into the code and even the running system and everything. But when it comes to actually applying this to, um, to a real world scenario in the machine learning context, uh, combining this code with our data and being able to version our data and these types of things, managing this data loop uh, can become quite complex and difficult. So with that, I'm gonna to go to an introduction to Pachyderm and talk about some of the things that we do. So for Pachyderm, uh, what we really do is uh, we work with version data and automated pipelines. And in particular, we're more of an infrastructure first or a scalability first approach to these things. So the thought process is if we have data versioning and data pipelines, they can work together. Um, if we know everything that's happened to our data and the exact versions of our data at any particular time, then we can combine these with pipelines where we have version code and know exactly what's, what's in this code. And then when we apply the code to the, the data, the versions of our data, then we can get a full lineage of everything that's happened. And so what this actually looks like in production, if we look at where Pachyderm fits, really these data-driven pipelines and data versioning <clears throat> and lineage exist on top of Kubernetes and uh, cloud uh, object storage or on-prem object storage. And so there's a variety of benefits here, but um, and we're going to go through some of them. But really, Pachyderm kind of acts as this sort of data foundation for machine learning, or this this uh, this layer that can connect your different um, your different pieces of technology, whether that's in the prepare stage, or if you're applying a PyTorch model, or training a model, or even working with uh, Jupyter notebooks or whatever else. Pachyderm kind of fits into this data and orchestration layer uh, to some degree that works on top of Kubernetes and cloud storage. So when we talk about data versioning itself, and we're going to go through an example, so I'll, I'll run through this relatively quickly and we'll see it, uh, see it in practice. When we talk about data versioning, um, Pachyderm itself uses a Git-like structure, so not exactly Git, but uh, it also works on, a, 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 on file-based versioning. So Pachyderm isn't actually, um, I guess, tied to structured data. You can use it with unstructured data like images, audio, video. Uh, and all of these types of things. And me personally, one of the, before I worked at Pachyderm, I was actually a user of it for, because we were working on speech recognition models and uh, working with anything with, you know, terabytes of audio data for your, uh, for your model training is, is pretty difficult and unwieldy. And so one of the reasons we looked at Pachyderm was it's Git-like structure, but it also scales. So for instance, it supports up to petabytes of unstructured data. It does, uh, data um, deduplication, which is really great if you're iterating on particular components um, or particular pieces of data itself. And then not only that, but it provides, uh, you can also look back at intermediate re results and store things as native objects. So we'll see this. So basically if I push an, uh, um, an audio file to a uh, Pachyderm data repository, then it will version exactly that, that binary file. And if I add you know, three, four seconds to the end of that file, only that new piece gets versioned. So we'll, we'll see some of this stuff, but uh, that's one of the, the pretty uh, interesting things there. And then on the pipelines front, uh, so Pachyderm itself, it's Kubernetes native. And the way that we actually uh, create pipelines themselves is pipelines are really Docker containers. <clears throat> so what this means is anything that you can put inside of a Docker container, um, you can run as a Pachyderm pipeline. Uh, and so that, while that itself isn't a novel thing, the way that we can combine these things with data repositories um, actually means that we can have, anytime our data is changed, we can have a data-driven approach to things. So anytime I've added data to my data set or anytime I've changed data, um, it can, we can actually have it automatically kick, kick off whatever downstream processes we want uh, because uh, we have this data versioning and these data pipelines that are, that are tightly coupled. So this means that we can automate pipelines. We can also uh, scale things out according to um, how our data is written into them. Uh, there, there'll be some details there that I'm going to kind of gloss over, but some interesting things, uh, parallelization things that you can do there. Uh, but also you can do incremental processing. So if you're just adding some level of, uh, or some amount of, in my case, audio data to my data sets with some regularity, um, I can only process what's new and append that to the end of, uh, of my data set. So I don't have to actually reprocess all of my data every time I'm creating a, a large data set. And then finally, we have the data lineage that we talked about. So we're kind of working off that, that previous diagram of uh, the data versioning plus data pipelines leads to data lineage. Um, but data lineage gives you a, basically you can track everything that's happened. You can track the versions of your code and your models and even your data and maintain reproducibility across all of these things. 
And so this really gives you a historical uh, view of all the different things that have happened. And you can even uh, track, for instance, if I have an output model, I can look at the commit that that model was created in and know the exact state of, uh, of my data set or even the raw data that was pulled for creating that data set or for creating that model itself. So some very cool things there. Um, and so this is really the kind of the main thing, I'm gonna back up a little bit, uh, of what Pachyderm accomplishes. And it's, it's, it's really general and interesting on the things you can apply. So for instance, Pachyderm itself, in my opinion, is more of a platform where you can do many types of things. It doesn't have to be machine learning or, uh, or just a particular type of data processing. B these basic concepts are needed in a lot of different places and we see people using using them for all kinds of things, but machine learning in particular is an area where data versioning and reproducibility and applying pipelines in a scalable way has become kind of a crucial, uh, a crucial component for, for success in that realm. So now we want to move to machine learning ops and practice. So we've talked about uh, how, what Pachyderm is and uh, even like the different things that we need to monitor, the data loop, the coding loop, uh, and just the machine learning lifecycle in general <clears throat> and the uh, artifacts that are produced by them. And so now let's take a look at a particular example and, and what we're going to focus on in this scenario is uh, market sentiment analysis. So market sentiment analysis, if anyone's not familiar, you're taking a text input and you're training a model or using a model to predict uh, the emotional attitude that that piece of text represents towards what, what's ever in the text. So in this case, um, net sales increased from April to June uh, during earlier this year, we would actually consider that to be in the financial realm, a positive thing because uh, sales increase or net sales increase for that uh, the entity that's being referenced. And so while this may seem like a really simple model, uh, fear indexes and all these other things tend to uh, actually use market sentiment uh, models. And then even in addition to that, the um, the kind of setup that we're gonna go through here sort of represents a general NLP approach uh, that can be used for a variety of things, whether you're doing well market sentiment analysis or text classification or uh, even, um, I don't know, entity recognition or other types of NLP models in there. So when it comes to the data lifecycle and how we would set this up to, for iteration and actually how to uh, develop and deploy things uh, in general, <clears throat> this, is, um, this is more or less like what, I, what we would do today. So in the first stage, um, what we would do is we would probably take a large corpus of financial text data and we would train a language model. And what this does is training a language model is using an unstructured approach to train on a, a large corpus of text data. And while this doesn't actually get us any closer to being able to do sentiment necessarily, uh, the model itself actually allows us to learn general structures of financial language or even just language in general, the human language. And so what we can do then is we can take this trained model uh, from the, the general unstructured, or sorry, unsupervised approach. And then we can tune this for something specific, uh, in our case, market sentiment. And the reason that you would do this is it's much, much easier to tune a model that has a general understanding of the world than trying to curate a very large domain specific data set. This is usually very expensive. And if it's too small, then you're going to overfit to particular words or, or uh, situations in your data. But if you start with a general language model, then you can do much, much better. Um, as far as your performance and predictions go. So secondly, uh, incorporating this data life cycle. So we have our large corpus of financial data. We're gonna train our language model. They we then uh, tune this language model for sentiment analysis. <clears throat> we then would, in a real world scenario, deploy this model. And then we'd have production data coming in. Um, this is the data that we're predicting on and we're making inference on. Uh, but to the data life cycle itself doesn't just end when you put a model into production. In fact, I would actually argue that the deploying of a model is really the start of uh, applied machine learning, that you don't learn anything from your model until you actually put it into production. And when this production data comes in, you're likely to see a lot of different things, things that your model is prepared for, and most likely uh, a lot of things that your model wasn't prepared for. So incorporating the data lifecycle means taking the production data and even inference on this production data and then incorporating it back into uh, your domain specific data set and how you iterate on that and tune it for, for your new data. And so uh, we would usually grab production data. We would run it through a labeling process. This is usually a human interaction uh, in the labeling process or review process. And then we would incorporate that data, train a new model, and then deploy that into production. And then with some occasions, maybe we pull some of that data into our general language model training if there's a big delta there. Uh, 
Um, and I see a couple questions. There, there's some questions about uh, bias into the model and those types of things. Um, we'll we'll definitely discuss that a little bit in a second. Uh, but the output of uh, of a language model training would just be a, for instance, a binary artifact. In our case, it's going to be a PyTorch model, um, and then we're going to move move forward with it. And so uh, the question about data versioning or model versioning, it's a little bit of both. So Pachyderm itself, because we can handle any type of file, you uh, you kind of get both, both for free. You're already versioning your data, and then anything downstream is versioned as well, and your model is just another artifact in that scenario. So when we put this approach into Pachyderm itself, what it's going to look something like this. We'll probably have a couple of other pipelines that we'll see here in a second. Um, but we're just because uh, this is we have a short amount of time, we're going to skip the language model training and just start with a pre-trained language model. Um, in this case, we're using a hugging face model. Uh, Fimbert is the name of it. And I think I reference it in the um, in the Q and A portion at the end. So uh, you, I'll have a I'll, I'll link you to that model if you're interested in it. Um, but what we're going to have here is we're going to have our language model uh, that's going into our trained model, and then we're going to have um, our data set that's also feeding this trained model. And so um, in our case, we basically are going to have two inputs to creating our data set, and that's going to be financial phrase bank. So this is a pre-curated uh, language model, or sorry, a pre-curated uh, data set for uh, financial market sentiment. And then we're going to have this labeled data area, which is going to be where we're going to put new uh, inference predictions into uh, into Pachyderm, in our case, into this data repository, curate a data set, and then we're going to move on towards training our model. Uh, and we'll do some visualizations as well. And so this is kind of the overview of what we're going to what we're going to work and work with. I also see a quick question on um, does this only work for batching? Uh, it's in this case we kind of have it set up for more of a batching approach, but streaming can also be supported. There's there's maybe a few little caveats there, but um, Pachyderm itself basically anytime we add data. Um, if a pipeline is dependent on data, it's going to keep, Pachyderm is more of a living system. So anytime your data is going to change, it pretty much automatically kicks off downstream pipelines. And so what that means is as soon as data gets dropped in, then everything downstream is going, depending on how you've uh, set your pipelines up, will execute. So you can actually do streaming type workflows. And with that, we're going to move over to the demo. Um, I believe. All right. So um, also, this whole demo is uh, is available on our um, <clears throat> our examples page. So uh, GitHub.com Pachyderm slash examples is going to be um, is going to be where all of this is held. But we'll also drop that in the into um, the resources after the talk as well. So we just saw a similar diagram to this. Uh, the only additional thing here is um, that we have a basically label studio is also incorporated. So this is going to be what we use to uh, grab our raw data, uh, label it manually, and then that's going to feed our label data here, which will then automatically kick off our, our data set and everything. So what we're going to go through is we're just going to show how, how simple it is to create some of these things and also look at a few of the details of how our pipelines are constructed and even how data um, is versioned and represented inside of Pachyderm. So I've already done some of these initial setup things. That's just uh, downloading models and those types of things locally. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a data repository called Financial Phrase Bank. Um, and usually, like you can you can automate some of these things. I'm executing it in a notebook just because you can read some of the, the other details around around it. And then we're also going to uh, basically put a file on, and we use Git like syntax here. So Financial Phrase Bank is going to be the data repository that we create. And then we're going to have our branch master. And then uh, in our case, I'm giving it um, a specific name for what I want that file to be called and where I'm pulling that file or the path to that file. So when I execute this, we'll see it uh, create the repo and then update, upload the data. Um, and then what I have over here is the Pachyderm console. So this is going to be how I'm kind of monitoring and looking at some of the things that I'm creating. But we can also see a lot of uh, useful information about the size of my data set, or if I want to view the file itself, um, then here we can see uh, just kind of a preview of my file and what's uploaded there. And uh, because we just created, because um, Pachyderm data repositories are you know, versioning first, everything that you create here um, or everything that you put into this is automatically versioned. And so uh, this means that we can look at the different commits that have come in and even go back in time and look at 
uh, older versions of our data. And we'll do some of that in a little bit. So the next thing we're going to do, we'll run through this relatively quickly. But if there's any questions, definitely uh, drop them in the chat. I'm, I'm trying to kind of live monitor those as well. Uh, so we're going to create our language model repo. And in a real world scenario, if we had you know some more time, we would just train this language model. But it takes a little bit. So instead, we're uploading our uh, language model where, that we're starting from to this language model data repository. Um, I can view those files and see the different things that are incorporated into that model. I think there was a question of like what the format of this model was. Um, but this is a, a FinBert model. And we can see it's a PyTorch binary here. There's a um, config JSON file. So if we want to know, uh, yeah, this has our, our, our labels and those kinds of things um, and other types of files that we see in here, the vocab that's used and other types of things. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to deploy some packet and pipelines. Um, here I'm going to deploy two pipelines. Uh, one is our data set creation pipeline. Um, oh, whoops, I need to create one more thing. This is our labeled data. This is a placeholder data repository for when new data comes in later on. Um, so our first data set, that we're, or sorry, pipeline that we're going to create is our data set pipeline. And the second one is going to be our model training pipeline. So the data set pipeline, basically, uh, there's just a JSON uh, definition. It could also be YAML. Um, there's just going to be a JSON definition. <clears throat> and whenever we create a data repository, um, how Pachyderm works is, or sorry, uh, data set pipeline. Whenever we create a pipeline, how Pachyderm works is um, the pipeline gets created. You can actually also see it's data driven. There's data to be processed. So uh, this animation is showing that it's already kicking off that processing. Um, but how Pachyderm works is it basically creates this, oops, sorry. It creates this pipeline. Uh, I'll expand this to explain it a little bit, um, which is created from this pipeline specification. So in my case, I have a Docker image with some of my Python code inside of it. I have a command that's running. And this command is actually, in my case, uh, completions data set .py. Um, And what this, this does is it's going to grab my input data sources. And here I have my financial phrase bank and my labeled data, and then curate a data set. Now, when I create a pipeline, <coughs> It first creates the pipeline itself, and then it creates a data repository to handle any output files uh, from the, the pipeline itself. <clears throat> now, as we remember, uh, data, pi or, sorry, data repositories, everything's versioned. So this is actually how we get the, the lineage. Um, so Pachyderm knows exactly which files were input into this pipeline, and it actually knows exactly what files were created during the creation of that pipeline. And any files that were created get versioned, and then you have uh, knowledge of, for instance, which job uh, created which files uh, in the output. It has the input repositories and uh, even like which files were created in the output repository itself. Um, I see a couple of questions around how data versioning handles large, uh, large size of uh, data files. There's actually a really good um, blog post on how that works. <clears throat> but uh, basically, we do it by basically chunk-based diffing. And so um, we actually version based on uh, pieces of files uh, or pieces of the file that have changed. Um, so there's some pretty clever things that are going on under the hood to, to make that happen. But uh, that way, we can get some deep duplication when even large files have changed. We know that it's the same file, or even maybe if a piece of a file has changed, uh, we don't have to do a whole lot of duplication inside of that. Um, I also see a question about resources. So because we're backed by Kubernetes, it's actually pretty convenient. We'll see um, in our train model uh, data, or sorry, uh, pipeline. Um, if I look at the spec here, uh, all I needed to do was basically specify any specific resource uh, resource components that needed to be um, defined. And that can basically be, um, whoops, I keep doing that, uh, can be defined inside of my, um, my pipeline specification itself. And so, uh, so basically what we can see is we have our input data, repos or data repositories that feed our pipeline. If we look at our spec and how it kind of works under the hood, um, we have our inputs. And those inputs get mapped into essentially the Docker container. In our case, slash PFS is the packet arm file system. And our labeled data gets mapped in here, as well as our financial phrase bank data. And then anything, any file that's created in, this is a special packet arm slash PFS slash out. But anything that's created or put into PFS out when the job finishes automatically gets com uh, committed to the output data repository. So in my case here, if I look at my output data sets, data repository, I can see I have three CS CSV files or my train test and validation. I can even preview these and see uh, a little bit of details 
uh, or some small details around uh, that data itself. Um, so for, sorry, I'm just glancing at some of the questions. Uh, this metadata that we see in the UI, you can get to all of these things uh, via a, uh, the command line interface or one of our um, other language clients. Uh, as far as the central place for the, the, the metadata that you see here, basically there's ways to get to, get to all of this stuff um, depending on how you want to see it. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that question, but, but pretty much. Um, all right, so just in the interest of time, I'm going to move pretty quickly so I can leave some more time for questions at the end, even though we're addressing some of these. Um, and also, if you need more details, if I'm going too fast through some of these things, feel free to check out um, uh, the, the code itself that I think was linked in the chat. Thanks to whoever did that. Um, so the next thing we're going to do, this is more just for fun. We're going to deploy uh, a visualization pipeline. <clears throat> and what this visualization pipeline is going to do, it's just going to take in our data set and do, um, do some visualizations for uh, my training data set in this case. And notice I haven't actually told the pipeline to kick off. Basically, anytime I deploy a pipeline, it's data aware or data driven. And so because there's data that can be processed, it'll automatically process it. And if I ever change this data set, then it'll automatically kick off downstream processes because um, of this data-driven nature. Pachyderm is kind of like this pub-sub event-driven mentality. So when something upstream changes, and because we have the data versioning, we know when something has changed, then it can automatically uh, kick off downstream processes. Um, I see a quick question around uh, data streams and data lakes, such as BigQuery. Um, so we have done some, some work to incorporate or to uh, connect this to some data lakes, uh, like Snowflake is something uh, that we've been working on and should be released relatively soon. Uh, but we have some experimental features around that. So yeah, there's there's definitely some some good ways to uh, to grab data from structured data sources and incorporate it into Pachyderm. Usually that means uh, running a query and then versioning the output of that query uh, and turning that into like a CSV file or something like that that can be processed by machine learning pipelines. So this next thing that we're going to do is we're going to grab, uh, we're actually going to iterate on our data. So for instance, we've, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't actually show you guys. Um, so we've trained our model, uh, or this model training uh, process is already run. And if I view my files, I can see I have this PyTorch model binary. I have my test report. Um, and I can see that, uh, that this data itself, if I look at my test report, I can see, whoops, I should, I think I went to the wrong commit. then I can see that, uh, okay, I've got an 83% accuracy. That's not necessarily great. Um, but I, the first version of the file that I used was uh, that, um, that data set where only 50% of the labelers agreed. So uh, that was, I probably breezed over that, but we're using this sentences where 50% of the people agree. Uh, but now maybe I say like, okay, that's not sufficient. Instead, I want to uh, update my data set um, and here I'm just going to create a, uh, a branch of my data uh, where that was version one of my, my data set. And now um, I can even look at that branch and see uh, that you know, that exists. I have a commit hash for it if I ever want to get back to it, or even uh, I can just refer to it as v1 later on. Um, and now I'm going to, uh, in my situation, I'm going to remove that sentence is 50 agree. It'll still be captured. And I'm going to change that out with a version of the data set where all of them agree. Um, and so <clears throat> what this is going to do is basically it's, uh, if I zoom back out here, then I can see as soon as I uploaded this new version of my data set, it automatically kicks off all downstream processes because we have this kind of data-driven data nature to it. Um, if I look at the financial phrase bank um, uh, files, then I can see we have the sentences all agree. But if I go back to the previous commit, I can see I have that sentences 50 agree. Um, we could even look at... Uh, I guess as we saw there, we can see that uh, this file was added, um, uh, whereas the last time we had that file, it was added. And so this is automatically kicking off all my jobs. Everything's coordinated and handled under the, under the surface by Pachyderm, which is great. And then um, <clears throat> I can even look, uh, look back and see the previous versions of things. So for instance, if I look at my data sets pipeline, I should have the exact same files that are named train test and validation. Uh, but I can see that in my older commits, I can see these were added. In the newer ones, these are just the newer versions of the files um, and the sizes of things and everything like that. Um, 
just glancing at some of the questions. Uh, is there an integration with Kubeflow pipelines? There is. Um, I would have to look at the status, but we do have a, a number of people that interact with Kubeflow uh, if they want to run pipelines through that or using Pachyderm to kind of trigger those types of pipelines. Um, is there, let's see, can we package this pipeline code instead of a Kubernetes job or inside a Kubernetes job? Um, yes, I'd be curious exactly what you mean by that, but uh, all of these things are essentially running kind of a collection of pods and uh, these pods are uh, running inside of Kubernetes. So the there's a kind of a data mounting pod, if you will, that's running or that's putting the data inside of the Kubernetes container, that container's running and there's some other sidecar things that are running to keep all of this um, consistent. But uh, anything that's running inside of these pipelines could feasibly run in Kubernetes. Um, and then there's a question around, uh, I'll have to move a little bit quick, but um, is this model being retrained every time the input data file changes? Uh, in this scenario, yes, it is. Uh, so anytime I have a change to either of these inputs, the way I have it set up right now is that it will um, it will actually retrain my model, which in some scenarios may not be desirable, um, but in my scenario here uh, for, for the illustration, um, it, it's, it's uh, kind of what I was desired. Um, so, I'll, I'll come back to the next questions here in a minute, just so we, we have time and everything. <clears throat> but um, yeah, so now what we're going to do is we're going to version our newest version of our data set. So this means uh, I can even go into here and look at, um, I don't know, the commits to version one of my data and the things that are there. I can look at the master version and I might have to refresh, but uh, we, we'll see the, the version two pop up here. There it is, um, the version two of my data set and see the, the commits that were in the history of that, uh, that particular branch. So fun stuff there, all the things that you would expect to see inside of a, a monitoring tool uh, for, for something that has data and lineage um, would, would be there. So the last thing that we're going to do is, uh, in this example, and then I'll jump back into some questions, is we're going to create this raw data repository. Um, and really what this is, is I'm just adding a single file here that's uh, an example. If I preview this, it's just... Um, some text, and we're going to pretend that we've deployed our model. There, there are a few different ways you can deploy things, but in the interest of time, uh, we're just going to say we've deployed our model, and we have production data coming back into this. Um, if you're curious, there's uh, in the repo itself, there's a couple of different deployments, like Seldom being one, and uh, I think there's one other as well. Um, but we're just going to pretend that we've had our model deployed, we've predicted on some of it, and our predictions are being pulled uh, back into this um, raw data data repository. And what we've done over here is we actually have created a uh, Label Studio integration. So that means we can select Pachyderm as our storage backend for Label Studio. And uh, if I check the connection, uh, there's some configuration things. There's, there's, uh, it's, this is also in our examples repo. But I can <clears throat> add this as our backend storage. If I click Sync Storage uh, for both of these guys, um, then I see that, oops, let me edit this guy. Master. All right, there we are. And so when I sync my storage, basically what this is doing is uh, Label Studio in this scenario is aware of the data repository that I've connected to it. Um, and then when I click Sync Storage, it pulled all of that data into Label Studio. So if I go in here and look at that, that one example was pulled in, it's pulled into Label Studio's format. Now I can look at this and see uh, the CBOE volatility index is at 19.93. Um, this is a neutral reading. So I can see, oh, okay, my model did get this correct. I like the way this looks. I'm going to submit that. And what this is doing in Label Studio is it's kind of saving that, um, that prediction. But if I want to then push it to Pachyderm, um, I can go back to my cloud storage options. And then this is mainly so you don't do a whole bunch of commits or I don't retrain my model a bunch of different times. But um, after I've labeled that, I can click Sync Storage. This will push my data back to Pachyderm. And we'll see, uh, let's see, let's sync the one task. And perfect. So it um, updated my labeled data. So I can see I now have a file in here uh, called 2.json. I ran this example earlier. That's why it's night number two. And then um, you can see it also, it automatically kicked off all of the downstream uh, pipelines as well. So. Uh, so in my case, um, I've updated my data set with uh, production data in essence, and then we've automated the training uh, kickoff 
uh, the training model pick, uh, pipeline to kick off as well as the visualizations pipeline, which um, I just realized we, we haven't showed you yet. But if we look at, whoops. Always going to be a, a demo error, no matter when you try to run it. So if I go to my visualizations pipeline, I should be able to view the files here and see, in my case, case I have a word cloud and a few other types of files um, that just help me get a, a general idea. You could replace this type of a pipeline instead with something that's, um, say, a data test or SKU tests or other types of things and have them be kind of upstream of your model training task. Uh, so you can even build a variety of uh, testing framework uh, type suites inside of Pachyderm. Just because you're data driven, you can always run these things before downstream pipelines run. So there's some some pretty interesting architectures that we've seen and things that people would uh, would want to run here. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, I think that pretty much finishes our example, and uh, we're almost right in time. So I'm gonna pull back to my well, I'm going to keep this up for a second and run through the the other questions that were in here, and then we'll we'll move on to uh, the the rest of the Q and A. Um, so, how is a registered model served at real time or for real time prediction? Um, you can do some of these things in Pachyderm. We typically see a lot of people that use Selden or another framework to do their serving, just because of some of the other benefits. Pachyderm is kind of more this data foundation and data centric uh, processing loop or uh, processing foundation. And so um, <clears throat> while we can support that, we typically see a lot more people want to use one of the other uh, kind of AI infrastructure alliance partners that are that are working with those types of things, um, just because they have some built-in data drift things and things like that. Um, and then I think I saw a question of where uh, did these commands uh, run on the infrastructure? Um, so in this case, I'm running these inside of a notebook, but basically you can install the Pachyderm CLI and configure it. Uh, but inside of infrastructure, uh, Pachyderm is running inside Kubernetes. And so you would basically have a Kubernetes cluster that has Pachyderm installed on top of it. And then, uh, and then yeah, you would configure it and you'd run your commands from wherever you like, uh, as long as you're configured to it and it would execute the jobs in the Kubernetes cluster. And let's see, is it possible to sync the data and evolving insights uh, with applications such as Tableau or ERPs? Um, yeah, it's definitely possible to do that. Basically, depends on if you're trying to pull data in or push data out, but uh, because the pipelines themselves are Docker containers, pretty much anything you want to put inside of a Docker container, you can do that. And whenever that data updates, if uh, your pipeline is really just pushing data to uh, Tableau or pushing it to some other type of a system, um, there's definitely ways to do that. Uh, so we have a couple of examples of a uh, MySQL um, integration, there. this is more on the data warehouse side, but a MySQL integration as well as a uh, Snowflake one that's in progress and coming. Um, but that uh, those specific types of things are definitely doable and it's, it's really just writing the code to grab files and then push them uh, where you want them to be. Uh, anything with an API is pretty, pretty simple to, to, um, to create there. All right, so I'm gonna go back to my slides and Coming, I think we have about five minutes left. So uh, the last thing that I wanted to talk about is really we, we've talked is kind of review. So we talked a lot about how DevOps um, was really kind of instrumental for software engineering. How uh, any type of code changes or um, by adding some CI/CD as well as uh, the the data center or sorry the code centric mentalities of um, your data is always version or sorry your code is always versioned any changes to your code are tracked you can always roll back and test and merge these different things with Git um, and then what we see in machine learning is that when data changes uh, these are just as crucial as your code changes and so what we've tried to do at Pachyderm is kind of support the best of both worlds we don't want to replace your uh, DevOps infrastructure, or anything like that. If anything, we want you to be able to use the best in breed solutions for any particular task and facilitate uh, these data changes or this kind of data centric mentality um, when you've uh, when you want your code to update as well as when you want your data to to change and update. So, to this end, we actually this is a while back, but we created a GitHub action <clears throat> that anytime your data or your code changes, um, you can still run your unit tests and everything else. 
But we also uh, provide the ability for when your code changes, we can actually automatically rebuild our Docker container, update our pipeline, and push those changes to Pachyderm. So then you basically can have Pachyderm to manage all the things uh, for when your data changes and any types of processing that you need to do, and still use all your traditional DevOps approaches for when your code changes uh, and just push those updates to uh, the Pachyderm cluster so that you can kind of get this code plus data interaction and also use the best tools in Breed for, for both scenarios. And not only that, you have a full data lineage for everything that's happened in the process. And with that, I see a couple more questions coming in, but this is a, this is my last slide. Um, we'll move to kind of a full on Q and A, uh, and yeah, feel free to reach out uh, on Twitter or on our Slack group, or if you want to learn more. Um, and we'll do that. And this is the uh, the hugging face model that we used as a as a start. Uh, all right, so I'm looking over at the questions. Um, let's see, can we deploy Pachyderm on private company clusters or is it hosted by Pachyderm? So um, we've actually moved, uh, uh, this is kind of accidentally here, this Pachyderm hub, uh, we've actually moved to pretty much uh, all supporting people's installations wherever they are. So in this scenario, we're not doing as much of a SaaS anymore. We're mainly focused on deploying in either your cloud infrastructure or on-prem infrastructure, and we can support both. Basically, as long as you have the ability to have object storage and uh, Kubernetes, then we can deploy in that type of scenario. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Is there a way to build monitoring, i.e. like keep records and metrics like uh, recall precision and keep track of these things uh, th and what sources lead to the best model? Um, yeah, so there's there's a lot of ways that we can you can do that. Uh, <clears throat> so keeping track of metrics, in my case here, I just kept track of a few files, for instance, um, my, my config files for, for things like that. If you're wanting to do additional analytics on top of that um, or just look at the comparisons between model trains or model runs and those types of things, um, typically, I mean, we you, there's ways to build that on top of Pachyderm, but we've also built a couple of integrations, one with uh, ClearML and another with uh, weights and biases where you can still monitor all the different jobs that were trained in Pachyderm in one of their UIs and uh, do some comparisons there. Um, so there's there's a lot of cool ways that you can kind of treat, keep track of uh, different metrics and re like precision recall or whatever other kinds of metrics you want, as well as uh, still keeping the, I guess a reference to the data source that was created with it. And I think I answered that model or that, that question, but let me know if uh, I, I didn't specifically answer the question about the model. <clears throat> um, let's see, the next question I see is, could I elaborate more on how we can manage uh, GPU with pipelines? Um, so I think what you're asking is, um, can we do different types of GPU interactions or uh, those types of things. So right now, basically, if you can treat it as a um, as a Kubernetes resource, <clears throat> then it works fine in, inside your pipeline. Uh, you just are referring to that resource. So for instance, um, I can say, and it's also auto scaling enabled. So if we, if my pipeline needs a GPU and it's not running, it will free up that GPU to be used by other things. Or if it needs a GPU, it'll ask for for a GPU from uh, kind of Kubernetes resource scheduler. So, um, so yeah, there's plenty of ways you can do that. And even if you have, I don't know, a DGX box that's connected to your Kubernetes cluster, then you can request um, that a, a, that DGX box, for example, to to run your your pipeline or your task. Um, so there's there's a lot of ways that you can do that. Uh, and in particular, you may want to. Um, that there might be a, a few different ways that you want to do it. Or if you want to incorporate cluster GPUs, then you probably um, have, like, I don't know, a, G, a resource pool that you would you would actually ask a request inside of your pipeline as well. Uh, let's see, the last one I see here is, uh, can you give a real life example of pipelines in Pachyderm? So, <clears throat> so a lot of things, actually one uh, thing that I may have glossed over a little bit. So what I used to use Pachyderm for, uh, when I was working on speech recognition models was I would store all of my um, my audio data as well as the transcript data inside of Pachyderm. And we would usually have to do a pretty large operation to align the two and then also split that data out into say two minute chunks or one minute chunks or whatever our model required. And so uh, actually processing all that data was a really expensive operation and we may actually change um, the, yeah, the, the type of data that we would need. So, Basically, what we could do is we could sort, store the raw version of our data 
Uh, and because uh, one thing we kind of glossed over a little bit, because Pachyderm um, is data aware, we can also have these pipelines run uh, kind of horizontal jobs and process a bunch of those different pieces of data in parallel. So what we would do is we would actually use something called a, um, we could use a join operation on our, our transcripts as well as our audio files. And we would actually use a join operation and, and some, uh, some file path logic to uh, split out um, basically one transcript and one audio file per job. And then we would scale out the, the horizontal scaling of those pipelines by, I don't know, 1,000 to 10,000 to process a bunch of things in horizontal or in, uh, in parallel. And so um, <clears throat> that was an area where, and also because we were doing that and we had versioning on the input and versioning on the output, whenever we would add a new pair of uh, transcript plus audio pair, it wouldn't rerun everything. It would only uh, do this, what we call incremental processing. It would only process what was new and it would just append it to our, our large data set. So we had um, quite a few production, uh, or I, I, say, I guess I'll say real life examples because they were, they were more in experimentation, but um, uh, pipelines that we're using, we were using Pachyderm for. And then um, sometimes we would either do some experimentation or some research with those data sets other times we would train a model and then push that out to our data scientists to fine tune in a production setting. Um, but overall, that was kind of the, uh, the overall structure of what we do. So with that, I think I'm about three minutes over. I can talk about this stuff for a long time and thanks for the good questions during the process. Hopefully I hit most of them. I might've missed a couple though. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out if you're at the conference uh, <clears throat> this week in the in-person one, definitely drop by the booth and say hi and hang out with us and we'll, we'll talk about all kinds of things. So um, yeah, thanks again and, uh, and see you guys online.